So perhaps the best historical example is the way that the, 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 the Red Army uh, ultimately found effective way of using tanks in World War II. They started off with these tank units with a thousand plus tanks in them, and they didn't have the command and control to manage it. It was a disaster. So they went back to basics. They went down to, they thought, all right, let's start with battalions and let's get those working. Then let's build up to divisions and core. And eventually they found a system, an organizational system, that was nowhere near as slick as that that the Germans had, uh, but nonetheless was effective. And, you know, I think the same applies to the way that the Russian army is incorporating drones into the military system uh, in the war in Ukraine. So, you know, they're not frightened to experiment as well, both with organization, particularly with organization. Um, a good example from the uh, current war in Ukraine, uh, you know, they, they experimented with battalion tactical groups early on. Uh, they clearly were working out. Not only were they happy, willing to experiment, but they were willing to get rid of it and say it wasn't working. They scrapped them uh, and, and moved on. Now, another thing that I think does come through in the Western press is that the Russian armed forces have shown perhaps more considerable material staying power in the war in Ukraine than Western governments and commentators at least would have liked to have thought. Now, although in modern Russian urban society, uh, young people are, are more Western uh, than their parents, there's still, I think, for those of you who are of Russian or Ukrainian origin, I think it probably applies to Ukraine as well, uh, a tendency left up from the past to be accept making do with less, and improvising in the face of material shortages. You know, I've still seen this in the Russian armed forces, and I think to some extent this has been a strength as the war has dragged on. The Western press has tended to mock the appearance of outdated Soviet military equipment, uh, you know, T-62 tanks, you know, things like that. But, you know, that, that tendency to stockpile things, you know, anyone who's been to a, an older Russian's house, or a, I assume the same applies in Ukraine, the stuff stacked up to the ceiling, uh, you know, the Russian military sort of had the same sort of idea, they, they kept a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's not fantastic, it's old, and you know, some of the shells don't go off, but it's better than not having any shells. Um, you know, another example would be these trenching machines from the Cold War. The Russians never really dropped the whole idea of fortifications, even when Western armies were, were talking about maneuver is, is the only way. You know, you see these trench, ancient trenching machines, the BTM-3 for those of the geeks, an example used really by both sides to good effect in, in this increasing position of warfare. And, you know, the Russian armed forces have historically placed considerable emphasis on the value of, and conversely, the breaching of fortified uh, defensive positions in depth. They continue to put a lot of emphasis on this, even in the later Cold War period, uh, long after Western armies was had sort of given up on it. Um, they have a long history of, of, of processing that experience. You know, the amount of effort that went into processing the failure to breach the Mannerheim Nine in 1939 was, was considerable. Uh, Russian military journals today, they, you know, they, one of the strengths, I think, is, is the way that they, they try to find links between historical material and the present. There's a Russian military journal just called the Military History Journal, which comes out every month, and its aim is really just to highlight how past historical examples might have some relevance uh, in the present. And, um, you know, there's obviously an awareness through this analysis of historical material, what historical strengths have been, both in the, the Soviet and Russian armies, so and, and to some extent, what some of the weaknesses have been and continue to be. So obviously, artillery has been a historical strength. Uh, command and control has been a historical weakness. 
uh, and their historical material uh, makes that quite plain. So just to, 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 to clue, these are, these are just a series of thoughts, just to, to sort of bring this to some sort of conclusion. Russian performance at the beginning of the war in Ukraine highlighted many failings within the Russian armed forces, possibly many more than strengths. But more recently, the Russian armed forces have been able to play to those existing strengths and have doubled down on a war effort that wasn't taken, uh, at least initially, sufficiently seriously despite evidence that you know, Ukraine is clearly going to put up a lot more resistance than was expected. And they should have known that on the basis of fighting in, uh, since 2014. Contrary to some less than informed reports in the Western press, Russian forces have shown a capacity to adapt, particularly with regards, regards to technology. And you know, consequently, I think it's um, unlikely that supplying more and more varied Western technology to Ukraine is likely to provide decisive and bring the sort of victory that Ukrainian leaders are hoping for. Indeed, as I wrote back in the autumn of 2022, escalation by one side is likely to be met by counter-escalation and adaptation by the other, resulting, I, I'm afraid, in a continuation of the sort of stalemate that has characterized the war during 2023. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Dr. Hubert mentioned, I my research focuses on change in the U.S. military, particularly the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Army. So what I want to do is sort of talk about some things some observations about the war itself. But what is interesting about this war is it is on a scale and it is fundamentally asynchronous to the types of wars we've been fighting and thinking about fighting for the last 20 some odd years. It's very different. Um, and so not least people like me watching what are the lessons, what, what are different about this, our NATO, the NATO military, the US military, the Canadian military, all our allied millers are watching this extremely closely from afar. Uh, and so what I want to do is sort of run down some of these core, core things. And I said, I probably don't have enough time to get through them all because they are a plethora of them. Uh, but I want to start with a few basic observations or perhaps caveats. First, it's worthwhile pointing out that there's a difference between lessons observed and lessons learned. That is, people can observe all kinds of lessons, but unless they basically take them in and figure out how they apply to themselves and then implement them in their own forces, they're just observations, nothing more. Uh, that said, there are a long list of observations we can make. And again, once I started thinking about the observations I've been making, I started digging around and already our militaries are starting to learn these lessons that is implementing or attempting to implement solutions. Secondly, I do want to warn, and sort of Alex somewhat referred to this, there's a tendency for Western armchair analysts to rush to premature judgment. I'm sure you all remember back sort of last March, April, May, the tank is dead. They were everywhere. These proclamations that the tank is dead. Well, maybe the tank is dead, whoever won with the tank. Um, basically, when your opponent shows up with mass and tanks, you better have mass and tanks to oppose. And certainly both sides, the Russians and the Ukrainians, want more tanks. They are useful and remain useful. That said, there are some adaptations, which I'll just touch upon. Coke cages, those cages on top. Uh, I'm sure you can see the Israelis, the Merkava tanks, you're putting them on top. Those aren't very good against uh, javelins, but they're good against drone dropping grenades on your hatch, or even rocket propelled grenades. The U.S. Army has already moved from their next modification of the M1 Abrams, I think they're about Mod 4. The Mod 5, they scrapped that. They put that aside. They're saying, we're going to go back to first principles and design a new Abrams tank from the inside out, based on what we're learning and seeing. And so it's an engineering approach. 
And then to quote one Army general, we appreciate that future battlefields pose new challenges to the tank as we study recent and ongoing conflicts. The war in Ukraine has highlighted the critical need for integrated protection for soldiers built from within rather than put on the outside. Because that's the way we've been modifying our tanks, add more and more and more and so on, which means to get heavier and heavier, bigger and bigger. So they're going back sort of to the first principle. Third, and again, some people here may not like this, but generals tend to fight the last war. They tend to refight it, though. And indeed, as I sometimes say, they tend to fight the last battle, the last war they fought. In. And it's, that's what they know, and that's what they tend to do. That can lead to learning the wrong lessons. And that's always a problem. Everybody's focused on the war between Ukraine and Russia. Perfectly reasonable. But lessons learned there may not be universally applicable. Uh, context matters. Each war is unique. Geography matters. War in the Pacific against China is not going to be the same as the war in Eastern Europe that's ongoing now. It's going to be very different. Uh, so lessons learned may not be applicable at all elsewhere, or they only may be partially applicable, and we need to remember that going forward. So start with sort of some a couple of strategic or at least operational level lessons that are seeming seeming being learned. One of the reasons why our Western militaries are really focused on this war is it's a war that's being fought under contested airspace. I thought and thought about this and I can't remember when the United States did not fight with air superiority, if not air supremacy, since the end of World War II. That's a long time to have command, command of the air. That's not the case in Ukraine. Uh, it's contested <laughs> airspace. And that's very different from the wars they've been involved in. Aircraft are more vulnerable, particularly from ground feet, from below about 10,000 feet, and about 20,000 feet above, they're vulnerable. There's a space in between, yeah, well, they're relatively safe and maybe down at about you know, 100 feet, 50 feet off the ground. I remember very early in the war seeing a picture of a Ukrainian jet landing on a highway, going to come back to highways in a bit, with a road sign stuck in its wing. That's how low they were flying to avoid being shot down. Uh, moreover, air bases are vulnerable. They're static, so they're targetable. And we saw that the Russians certainly went after Ukrainian air bases. And so what they're doing is looking at how you deal with that. Now, again, none of this is new. We know this. The U.S. has a doctrine called Agile Combat Employment, ACE. But everybody else is learning it now, too. You can't leave your aircraft on an airbase. You need to disperse it out away from the airbase when the war starts. And other states are learning this. Finland just very recently landed two F 35s, uh, very sophisticated aircraft, on one of their highways. And are planning to ensure that all our highways will in future be able to land air, aircraft. Uh, Poland, in a recent military exercise, conducted practice landings on several of its main highways, up to including transport aircraft, with some of these landings being conducted at night. So they know how to do this at night. U.S. Air Force has also done these tests in the Western United States over the last four or five months, including landing C 130s on a highway. Um, and NATO is currently looking to employ their own idea of this agile combat employment, identifying 20 to 25 different positions about Europe, because they've reduced all the air bases they used to have. Now, this is particularly pertinent for those states close to conflict zones. Uh, now, they understand landing aircraft on a highway could interfere with troop movements, logistic movements, etc. So you've got to figure all that out. How does this all work? You also need to figure out new and better ways how to degrade enemy air defenses. We're very good at it in the West, have been very good at it. Look at the first 1991 Iraq War, the second 1991, uh, 2003 Iraq War. And I say this is very good at it. But other people get good at not being taken out. So you have to improve your capability because basically air defenses are increasingly seen as important. And one thing I hadn't thought about, discovered, is both the United States and Canada 
have determined that our strategic air defenses have holes in them. They're watching Russian cruise missiles that are being used in the war in Ukraine and going, we have a problem. And the US military, uh, in order to increase their ability to detect and track such uh, cruise missiles, along with Canada, are now working towards deploying six new over-the-horizon radar systems that are capable of detecting these, four in the northwest part of the United States and two in southern Ontario. Uh, they're just at the point, it's early days, the United States is putting in funding to buy, start flying up across this land. Each one of these things takes like 1,500 acres. That's a lot of land you have to buy. They're already moving down that road. So those are a couple of early lessons about the air war component of this. Now, more operational, tactical level stuff. As mentioned before, drones are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Now, drones aren't new. The proliferation of the types of drones being used is very remarkable. Now, over the last several years, decade or so, Drones were seen as fairly large things that are capable of carrying precision guided missions like Hellfire. That is, we've all seen pictures of Reapers with well, Hellfire missiles strapped them in. One of the early lessons is those aren't survivable. Uh, all of you may remember the reports of Ukraine using the Turkish Bayraktar drones to great effect in the earlier stages of the war. They're gone. The only place they're now being used is well back behind the front lanes for surveillance purposes, because they don't survive because of the air defense problems. But what we do see is this increase in unmanned drones at much smaller levels, that small to mid-sized drones. And as we've seen, it's small and cheap loitering musicians carried by drones, whether hand grenades or anti-tank uh, warheads, RPG warheads, taking out expensive, massive tanks. That's a, that's a good economic return. Uh, in terms of these things. That is, they're using hobby drones, both sides of this, Alex said. Basically, the Russians have gotten on board with this and they're really mass producing large numbers of cheap drones. But this is not something new per se. We've seen this used by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And again, we saw that in the war between uh, Azerbaijani blocking out Armenian air defenses and armored vehicles in that particular war a couple of years ago. One of the new things, though, are these things called first-person drones, first-person vehicle drones. They do. You may have seen some of these. Again, the first time I watched one, I thought, this is really kind of go, well, I don't want to watch that brand of this, because literally the operators are looking through a TV camera and flying it, using that right into vehicles, right into bunkers, Literally, I saw one fly into the back of a cargo truck and it was moving, and that's when I turned it off. Wait a minute. These things are very effective. They're very good against hard point targets. Moreover, they can use terrain to hide. I've seen several films of these first person view drones flying through forested areas below a tree line, around through the trees. Uh, so they're very hard to detect. So they're using them in unique ways, helping to uh, locate targets for artillery strikes, uh, for counter-battery fire, rather than using counter-battery radars, which has been our standard for the last 30, 40 years. But the other component of this, one that's a little bit more remarkable, are the proliferation of small surveillance drones. Again, if you've watched any of these videos coming out, you can see a drone hitting a tank, but it's being taken from a picture from another drone elsewhere. And what we're seeing is a battlefield that is completely flooded with sensors to the point where it's almost impossible to stay hidden. As the Ukrainians have pointed out, In relatively open ground, and even in somewhat forested areas, a column of tanks or a column of advancing troops can be discovered in three to five minutes and hit in another three minutes. That is, if one general, Ukrainian general put it, survivability on the move of our forces is no more than 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, it was transparent battlefield emerging. This is one of the most unique features of that war. 
And of course, there's this dawning recognition we, our militaries need to learn how to operate in such a conflict, such a battleground where everything can be seen. Uh, now, the U.S. military, again, the U.S. Army, they're going to buy you know, small UAVs that you know, have are explosives that can be used to attack tanks or bunkers, whatever the case may be. Uh, you're going to get more and more surveillance drones as their own. But two things that are interesting about this is first, they recognize that there's so many drones flying around the front line battlefield in Ukraine at the moment that the Ukrainians are using air control techniques to try to manage the proliferation of the numbers so they're not flying into each other and they got to figure out how they do that. And secondly, a lesson that I'm not sure they've learned yet is that Ukraine loses upward of 3,000 to 10,000 drones a month. That's how many are taken out, shot down, used up as a case may be. And indeed, uh, one comment I've I, I, read, I came across as a small unit can use up to 20 drones per day. They're using three, four hundred dollar drones. The United States Army and our militaries are going out to private companies to build them drones and they're going to cost about five, six, ten, twelve thousand dollars. That's not a bad return for taking out a tank, but if you're going through ten thousand a month, that's a heavy economic load. I'm not sure they've figured out that lesson. Now, learning to deal with this, U.S. and the military, they're now practicing drills to avoid being spotted, and this is training, uh, how to use their drones, how to, you know, use drones down to the lowest levels, and indeed spread them out so they're pretty ubiquitous across the forces so they don't need an awful lot of people to use. They're doing various sorts of things there. But you also have to defend against drones. And this is deeply problematic. It's not the case, as people kind of thought, you pull out a gun, shoot bullets at it. Um, the Ukrainians have found, and I'm sure the Russians have found, that doesn't work particularly well. You can shoot down some drones, but A, you got to see them first. You got to know they're there first, and you're not always going to hit them. Increasingly, what they're using is electronic warfare, trying to block their signals so they go crazy. And again, both sides, Russians have got their, we're probably better at it first. And the Ukrainians are now catching up. The key element here is they need, our Western militaries really need to work out a way to deal with drones, not least drones, and whether that be through ballistic means, whether electric monitoring warfare, they're talking about cyber attacks, it's, can we hack drones when they're in the air? Uh, it's, just, it's the electronic warfare that seems to be the most effective and ultimately the cheapest. Uh, not least because, of course, what we're seeing is an awful lot of individuals or pairs of drones, even trios of drones flying around together. What nobody has done quite yet, or at least I haven't, I'm not aware of this happening in Ukraine, of basically drone swarms. We've all seen those nice little pretty lights with the Christmas lights that have the drones flying around rather than fireworks. Put hand grenades on those. RPGs, off you go. You can, you can fly these things around. How do you deal with that? Just so far, nobody's used that, that I'm aware of. But it's coming. Which brings us to another element where the United States and some of our allies, electronic warfare. Uh, again, it's become very prevalent on the battlefield there. And Basically, in the United States, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force have certainly maintained their electronic warfare capabilities because they're worried about jamming enemy radars, anti-aircraft weapons, and so on and so forth. The Army, not so much. In fact, they've let their electronic warfare capabilities really degrade and, and, and lay fallow for the last 20 some odd years because they weren't up against a peer competitor at all. And they run into a couple of real obvious issues they have to deal with. First, for those of you who don't know, GPS doesn't work on the battlefront in Ukraine. It's been suppressed. So how do you actually now organize and manage people in the battlefield when they don't know where you know? Because most soldiers today go, compass, map, what's that? 
I just look at my GPS. No. So they're going back to basics. How to teach soldiers how to map and come, how, how to land navigate using those simple techniques. We're also trying to develop new techniques that will replace GPS. Uh, the key thing is they don't want the soldiers to be dependent upon GPS anymore because you cannot expect it to be available to them anymore. So, yeah, the U.S. Army is attempting to rebuild its electronic warfare. They have an electronic warfare school, a uh, small unit. It's getting bigger. Over the last four or five months, they're starting to pump more money into it. Moreover, they recognize the better improved Intel uh, signals gathering. Uh, they will locate radio transmitters when you're on the ground near the front line. And indeed, a cage, you know, some sort of capability to prevent the enemy from utilizing their E-Devil W capabilities. And they need this dam to the platoon or squad level. It's not just simply up at the battalion level where it used to exist or the division level. You need to have it all the way down to the level of, of the actual soldier. And again, you're starting to act on this. Uh, starting to train students, again, soldiers how to land that. But also, comms, discipline. Don't use consummate. How do we fight without comms if our EW capabilities don't work? You need to start training for that. And again, the recent exercise uh, project, uh, Operation Convergence, it's one of the things they trained, okay? You got all your comms are gone. How do you fight? It's called Mission Command, but again, that's something the US Army struggled with for 20 odd years. That's the name, name right forward. I just want to finish off, and one thing, I got a whole long list of these things. Way more. But to finish off, the other key big lesson looking at from the Western military is the vulnerability of their command posts. The Ukrainians have been very successful in targeting Russian commanders and Russian command posts throughout the war. Uh, that's a problem for the U.S. military in particular, because their command posts have gotten larger, bigger, heavier, and they turn massive amounts of electronic munitions that are detectable at great range. If you can detect them, you can be spotted by sensors, and you can be hit. They're trying to explore a better way to manage the command and control of the forces to command post, down to basically being able to command a brigade or even higher using, say, five LADs, striker brigades, striker vehicles. Can we actually do that? Can we basically operate on the move? And they're already talking about if you set up a command post, you've got 30 minutes of life expectancy. That's very short. As one put it, it says, it's item number 27 on your list of setting up command posts, setting up the coffee maker, because everybody knows so it's like coffee, you're too late. That's where they're at. So they're trying to work all this stuff out. So some things are already moving down ways to try and develop say, counter drone things, etc. And other things are now sort of just going into experimental phase. So those are just some of my early observations. And I can talk about these artillery, cyber warfare. Uh, info warfare, helo, helicopter vulnerability, munitions stockpile, blah, 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 lots. But the key point here is none of what you're seeing is anything particular new. All these things are things they kind of knew before and were working on, but they're appearing in different ways. So there are some commentators out there going, this is a transformation of war. No. This is more of an evolutionary change. Transformations take a long time. They don't happen in one war. They happen over many wars. And when they talk about transformation in a war, I go, uh, World War I, trenches. And for those of you who are not aware that the Ukrainians are using German infiltration tactics or developing World War I to attack those trenches. Literally parts of that war are World War I written all over. So it's evolutionary change. That change may lead to an ultimate transformation. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for two very insightful, powerful presentations. We now will open up for questions. Please identify who you want to direct your question to. We have a mic, we will be passing it around. And so I will open up the session for anybody that would care to to, uh, to begin the questioning.
Yes, sir. If I can get you to stand up, and David will provide you with the mic. Gosh. <laughs> uh, this is for Dr. Hill, and um, I something I wrote about uh, the Russian-Finnish uh, winter war was that the uh, Finns were fed uh, sausage soup and uh, other hearty fare. And I, I wonder what happened to the Russians during that war and how they modified their uh, practices afterwards. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't think about it. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, they, 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 it was a major disaster, the first initial phase of the war in Finland. And they weren't just concerned with um, you know, use of tanks, storming fortified positions and things like that. They went all the way down to, you know, how can we better get food to the front line? Um, you know, clothing, if you would have thought that they would be in Russia, they'd be pretty hot on getting the right clothing, but no, they went back to basics. They, they you know, revised their winter clothing provisions. So it wasn't just a sort of lesson learned on the sort of, on, on, on the, you know, the tactics operations, it went all the way down to things like delivering food to the front line and things like that. I mean, I, I don't know, I can't really give you much more detail than that. Um, uh, for those that are interested, the, the, the uh, transcripts of the meeting, this, this conference that they held uh, to analyse the war actually have been translated into English and published, and they're quite interesting. Those are interested in pre world, the origins of you know, pre World War II stuff. Uh, they're an interesting read. Over here, sir. Make sure you there. Um, I've got well, actually quite a few questions, but um, I'm trying to stay out of the political world a little bit. But I had kind of two, two questions for Dr. Hill. One, um, we're meeting here in Calgary, Alberta, and we're able to talk about anything we want fairly freely uh, about things. So my first question, and you can pick which one you want to answer, but my first question is, would you have any knowledge of what's going on in Russia itself about, there's obviously great military historians there, there's, you know, uh, we hear stories of suppression of the media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so do you have any inkling what's, or maybe, the other professor would even know that too, I don't know. Uh, like, I'm kind of curious what's going on academically now. Like, how do you do this research? How do you, you know, what are, what's kind of going on that? The second part that I'm also intrigued with is you said, um, and again, I know you can't get a complicated answer here, but uh, you said, well, it's kind of like the West shouldn't, I shouldn't say shouldn't. You just kind of said providing them with more sophisticated systems from the West isn't, isn't kind of going to make a difference, or I'm not exactly, I don't want to reword what you said, but um, what would be the solution of what, you know, Canada and the United States should do? So those are two questions that either of you could tackle, um, and just do one because of time. Sure. I'll answer the first one. And, uh, I'll exact. <laughs> yes. Uh, the first one, I, I mean, I was actually in Russia last November. I plan to go to Russia again uh, in a couple of weeks' time. No, I'm not, I have colleagues there, I still go to historical conferences. I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, in a wartime setting, there's a, a sort of patriotization, if you like, of academic work. It would happen anywhere, it would happen here if there was a war. Clearly, there are pressures on academics to, you know, find motivational examples uh, in history, things like that. Uh, you know, I, I, engaged in a debate with a colleague recently in Russia who uh, they, they decided to describe fighting in the Donbass in World War II as fighting in Russia. And I said, come on, you're a historian here, that's ridiculous. Nobody was calling it Russia back in the, in, in, in the Soviet period. But, you know, it's just a little example uh, of that sort of patriotization Author. But as I say, it would happen. It would happen anywhere. I'm sure it's happening in Ukraine. Uh, I don't think that's surprising. Harry, they want me to stand up so you can hit me with sharp things. I think. 
There is no gold, technological golden bullet to this war. Just doesn't exist. Unless somebody wants to use a nuclear weapon. Don't want that. Uh, basically, and again, this comes to one of the other little lessons. And again, we all know about there's not artillery's become a king of the battlefield. And one of the things Ukraine constantly wants is if we had more precision guided munitions, particularly our precision guide, we would do much better. But basically, precision is important, but most of the killing, most of the damage is being done by the old dumb artillery bombs, which you can do. And so there's this over emphasis on this really high tech technology that is, you know, sophisticated sorts of things. You can fight very well without it. Having some is good, but you don't need, you know, if you have all your artillery shot stocks or precision guided, that's deeply expensive. Uh, and again, for the most of you who don't know, the American, the American government controls the production of all artillery shells that aren't precision. All that is over there in the private sector, whether it's artillery shells, precision guided missiles, all that stuff. That's way more expensive, and they have very little control of it. So, yeah, you want more 155 millimeter sh uh, shells, and this one of the things they're learning. What's an adequate stockpile? Well, they're learning that by having the stockpiles and the production capabilities are nowhere near what they likely need to be. So they're actually going from, I think they're, they're producing about 28,000 uh, 155 millimeter shells per year. Um, Ukraine's going through about 30,000 a month. So how do we increase the... They're literally by 2026 to be up to 100,000 shells extra. But that's because they can build new factories because they control that precision. They're not sure what to do about that. Because our private company who's there for the profit, are they going to increase output, increase the factory uh, capabilities to output? Going, yeah, that four years down the road, they're not going to want us to build these things. That's a problem. So you have to sort these things out. So I said, send the F-16s. It will help, but it's not a golden bullet. M1, A2, Abrams tanks, 31, are now in Ukraine. Yeah, they're very good tanks. and probably the best tank on the planet. But are they going to turn the tide of the war? No. Very useful if you ever break through those lines and have a free run. Yeah, it can be very useful. But they're not going to be the game changer that wins the war. There's, there's nothing out there that's going to do that. What's going to win the war is persistence, resilience, morale, courage. That's almost virtually a comment from an American general going, that's why the Ukrainians are doing as well as they are. And to be fair, that's one of the reasons why the Russians have been so resistant and resilient in their resistance. And again, no, there's no golden bullets to this. Could South American stockpiles of munitions to the extent where it could mobilize the Ukrainian supply? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a good question, and it's kind of spot on because basically there is a concern. So the U.S. military has a very substantial stock, I think, like artillery shells, but you know, sending back Iron Bill, the two batteries that they have, they're sending those back. Everything they send to Israel, they can't send to Ukraine, and of course. Ukrainians, President Zelensky, most of Zelensky, very openly complaining about this. Because already supplies are getting them more slowly than the Ukrainians have got. Logistics is an issue. So, again, it's part of how much do we actually need? And the next question is need for what? For those who don't remember, historically, the United States had what they call the two war construct, that is being able to fight two wars. At the same time, one in the East against China or Korea, and one against Russia. It sort of went down to a one and a half war. There was one war and a minor contingency, and it kind of slid down to one war. That's where they're at now, and they're looking around, not just because Israel, because they're looking very carefully at what China's doing to the economy. And a very different sort of war that would be fought for. But nonetheless, do we have enough capability to manage? Fighting a war, that's why another war, and the answer is probably not over the long term. Very short term, yes, not long term. Again, that's why increased production of 155, and they're doing it for other things. How many drones can they produce? How cheap? 
They're looking at all kinds of things. The problem is in very early days. Uh, and they're still trying to figure out a lot of stuff is what is the appropriate best answer to that issue we see there. But at least they seem to be, a, they're observing the lessons of Russians, and they seem to be trying to learn the lessons and be able to address them. I think that answers your question. I'm going to jump back there just because I'm uh, trying to get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is for uh, Dr. Tara. I just, with your uh, comments there about uh, sort of the uh, a bit of a shift back to basic principles with things like, uh, you said, first world war nutrition tactics and the sort of right of return of conventional artillery. How much impact is this having? I mean, the US military, which is something we specialize in, it has generally become an extremely high end force, lots of, lots of top rate uh, uh, equipment and technology and that, but not a lot of it, and very much based on this precision and, and all that. How much are they sort of revising that idea, thinking like maybe we need more sort of middle rate, expendable or sort of replaceable uh, units in terms of these things to be uh, sort of sustainable in a, a war where this high tech equipment may not last as long as we hope it. Can I ask a quick point of clarification? Would you see expendable units? You mean units of people or units of. I, I mean, oh, well, in this case, mostly equipment in that. Okay. In the sense that you've got these extremely expensive. Because an American commander, no, we don't sacrifice units of people. Yeah, no, they die. The idea, yeah, to uh, that. The idea of, it's, of having. They, they are too expensive to lose. Yeah, they, are, they are starting to move down the road. So basically, they're in the recent uh, Operation Divergence. They were training how do you fight without command control? Once you lose all your, your cons, how do we fight in case that's a good Because part of, again, American very high tech, but everybody talks about, again, it's one of these things, again, probably seems it's about June, July. Oh, if you don't do it, if the Ukrainians don't fight the way we fight, they would have gone through those lines. Except that's combined arms warfare, and that's the answer. We fight no lines on taking over from everything. But we need air superiority to fight combined arms warfare. What happens if you don't have it? That's a problem. That's a real problem. You should need that, and that's in part and parcel the way we fight. So it's not something, there's no easy answer to that. It's about starting the appropriate training to get down to all kinds of things. I mean, they're rethinking their approach to artillery, saying, you know, rather than a bullet, we need a range of short to long range, like 155, and indeed we're developing ranges that need the longer for shells than the 155s at a long range, simply because if you're 15 miles behind the front line, you're still potentially vulnerable to counterattack. Given that drones can detect you, electric warfare can detect you because of symbols, all those sorts of things. So, how do you command you know, those? 30 minutes, you're dead. That's basically becoming the standard you're now talking about. And, and to which I know, the first time I read that, I thought, yeah, it's probably not on the reason. Um, but how do, you, how do you do that? You've got to train your soldiers in a different way. That's not something you should just going to like this way. Now, the way they fought is very difficult to shift. It's going to take years to shift that mindset. Mindsets change very slowly. Uh, I can't remember who was their famous. Uh, the only thing harder than getting a new idea into a military is getting an old idea out of it. Generals fight, always fight, ten minutes fight the last war. It's it's not easy. It's, it's one thing to say we can do this, but we've got in the U.S. Army about 450, 480,000 people. That's a lot of people to sort of retrain, get them. This is not just one exercise that's going to do it. It takes years of training, retraining, everything else. So change how you fight. Um, so that's a problem. Could be fine in the Pacific. And if you go up to Russia and Poland or someplace like that, they probably would be fine too. But they're looking at what's seen in the front line. Generals, American Army generals in particular, going to the program. I did mention these armchair generals going to find arms warfare. By the way, they're looking at it and what are you kidding about? We wouldn't get through that. Three lines of trenches well spread out, lines everywhere. With the Russians having adapted to using plastic defense instead of the a trench line, they retreat, they immediately turn around and come right back at them. Nothing new here. There was evolutions of what we're seeing. And it's just stuff that they haven't had to 
think of it as a point. Um, it pretty much until since 1991. And even then, they didn't even think about it too much because that was a $100 round. It's pretty straightforward by their standards. So, yeah, it would take a long time. So, 30 years of mindsets to change, training, muscle memory, all that stuff has to change. But exactly how they do that, it's still working. A question for both. A question for the whole panel. Um, your analog to Aurora One is well received, and thank you for your presentations. Um, we're seeing the same thing. This conflict started out of mobility rush was happening. And when the cavalry, the lower one, stopped, everybody went to ground, they built their trenches, their networks, and they went from there. We reached that point again where both sides are entrenched versus the Russians full of land. Yet the Ukrainians don't have the manpower to really attack the Russians. Like the Western armies of World War One, they built a tank. What technology has been able to enable the Ukrainians to overcome those Russian defenses? And what can the Russians do to exploit their manpower advantage to force the Ukrainians off the foot? I'll go first because get given any order before they do First, nobody knows what it's going to take. It's going to take. Individual leadership at the small unit level to break those lines. That was the infiltration lines. I mean, you're quite right, they don't have the manpower. But in places in the south where they've actually made those breakthroughs, that's what happened. They got infiltration tactics in and they started spreading out. That's, that was the German technique. But what they wanted to do, they were really wanted to do the infiltration. But they can't flow through because, again, the Russians get the three lines of trenches, minefields, pillboxes, etc. With this lots of defense. So you can't have a little narrow thing to which, because you try and drive anything in there like tanks, they just, they're going to get taken up by artillery. Uh, again, so 10 minutes, you're dead. Of course, it's the Ukrainian, it's a mission now. Uh, and indeed, the first time they attempted that was by using command, combined arms warfare as they were taught by the Americans. This is a disaster. A massive disaster in terms of loss of people, in terms of loss of Bradley vehicles, leopard tanks, all of those things are destroyed. They very quickly, that doesn't work. It's not going to work. So, yeah, we'll go back to what did we do in the past. But it's slow to go. And as Alex said, we're running into a sort of a stalemate in the third one. I mean, it's possible they break through the second and third one. But the Russians got to be, you know, they're piling up stuff because they have that manpower advantage, even if a lot of that manpower advantage is because they don't train. It's still a mess. That's matters. Uh, so there's no easy solution. Ideally, what the Ukrainians are hoping, so they've got their fingers crossed, is once they get to start flying their 16s, when it's maybe February, March, it's so literally starting to fly their 16s. Planes starting to see the training part. Training. They're very different aircraft. They're hoping that they can start to build, uh, to at least ensure. They have more air support, be able to apply more air support to what they're doing. But at the moment, helicopters, and even the Russians are sitting back three miles from the front line. And how many helicopters have they taken up? Like over 100 Russian ones, and we don't know how many the Ukrainian ones have taken up, but a lot. And they're doing things like, I mean, the Russians, they have precision guided anti tanks, sit on the things, so they can sit back three miles, about five kilometers to shoot. The Ukrainians are flying low, going up this, releasing missiles on a ballistic arc, and attempt to hit targets close to their front tactical ones. And helicopters are so, so the airspace contested really changes the dynamics and how you think about this. That's why I said so on everybody's watching this at the on. This contested airspace. What does it mean for us? Which comes back to the question you asked. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that either side is, is going to gain the upper hand. It's, not, it's, it's been my line since sort of October, November last year. I mean, obviously, Russia has advantages in terms of manpower, uh, you know, considerable equipment reserves, they're mobilizing their economy, uh, you know, a considerable proportion of GDP is soon going to be spent on defense. Uh, yes, Ukrainian side, obviously, you can or better Western equipment, but they've still got a manpower problem. Uh, ultimately, you know, hopefully we could catch up with them. 
Uh, as as um, my colleague had pointed out, I mean, a lot, is going to, a lot depends on morale. And I think the Western press has been quite misleading, in pretending that, that somehow you know, Russia's about to break any minute. Well, the Western press has been saying that since last summer. And it hasn't happened, and I'm pretty confident it won't happen. Uh, because, you know, in, whilst the situation might be seen as existential in Ukraine, I mean, to some extent, it's seen as existential in Russia. You know, uh, this, this, is, this is a war not with Ukraine necessarily anymore against Russia. This is a war of the Western world against Russia. Uh, and, you know, though that's gained a lot of traction. Uh, it was last October, November last time I was in Russia, and I can't believe it hasn't changed. What change this time? So, you know, morale is high on both sides. Obviously, casualties will start to dent that, but uh, you know, I don't see any side breaking in the, in the foreseeable future. And so, I just think the bloodshed will continue without either side getting very much at all. So, it's when, when the, the reality is that you know, at some point someone's going to have to break and say, okay, let's talk, I'm going to do something. <laughs> uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. This is for Dr. Kara. Um, just not on a practical military side, but on the academic side. Um, how are Western militaries studying this war? I mean, we can't pull the 73 East and go in with tape measures and and analyze every millimeter of the ground. So what, what is being done to study this war, aside from reading the news? Uh, the U.S. military is very good at interpreting video. There's so much video out there. It's right, and they have access to all of it. Because uh, <clears throat> that was one of the questions I had. I mean, my comment, my, my comment, comment was I'm talking to military people. How do you know that? So I think you know, I have to the question, I think. It works quite well for me. But then I'm not a military official. Um, they're also talking to the Ukrainian camp officers. So they're getting two things. So, I mean, again, proliferation of sensors, they do have satellites, so they're watching through their satellites. Uh, no doubt, the Ukrainians are probably sharing surveillance uh, information they're getting on the battlefields in the back yards, which are at the up yards, which are way back now. But some of the other stuff they have with the Americans is so showing that to you know, we're going to share this with you, we're going to give us more artillery shells, more F 110, whatever it is, as a trade off. They're also just studying, again, one person said we would watch all the uh, And there's a lot of video of you're properly trained, you can determine an awful lot of the size, distance, all kinds of things in those videos. And one of the interesting little observations for those who can hear me now and notice is the quality of the video of the first person view has exactly gotten much grainier. That's because they're moving to analog cameras because they're less susceptible to electronic warfare cameras rather than digital. So moving away from digital entirely as much as they possibly uh, but even with that, it, they can actually go into an awful lot. So that's how they're studying. So they're talking to the callers, their own observations, they're looking at all that. So they don't rely on the news reports. Uh, I, I used to laugh because when I first uh, when I first walked into the Marine U.S. Marine Corps, I said, I'll study you guys, and I'll do a report. I want to talk to you because you were against us or the report. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, the only people who write about this whole thing is a young Canadian working in an English university right now. It was interesting. Oh. Or, uh, my question is for Alexander. Could you maybe clarify how it is? that the Soviet and then Russian militaries always have to have the mess up phase at the beginning of the conflict. But then during the conflict, as you pointed out, 
they can then have the learning phase and the improvement phase. So how is it that they can't avoid the mess up phase and just learn from conflict to conflict? I mean, I, I think, I mean, this isn't a, just a, a Russian problem. <laughs> it's all government's problem. Obviously, you know, political leaders tend to be surrounded by sycophants and, uh, you know, people who tell what they want to hear. You know, I do think that, you know, to some extent, Putin was perhaps even more distant from reality at the beginning of the war than, say, you know, a Western leader might be. Um, so I think you know that distance from reality is probably is, is probably the reason. I, I, I don't, you know, it's not just about oh the generals are frightened of getting killed or repressed, you know, because they're not getting killed or repressed here. It's you know, I mean, similar situation could happen in you know Western scenario where you know the, the, the political leaders are pushing. Generals to do something that generals don't fall well is not particularly achievable. I mean, if you take the West and Afghanistan, uh, you know, it's not a dissimilar situation. So, but you know, I think I think that that being divorced from reality is probably the, the, the biggest cause of it. You know, the same thing applied to Stalin back in 1939-1940, cut off from sources of, you know, particularly in Stalin's case, in the aftermath of the Great Purges. You know, there were very few people who were willing to stick their head above, above the parapet and say, you know, this is a bad idea, or, um, and, and so, you know, mistakes happened. Uh, boss says, okay, things went very wrong there, we need to sort this out, and, uh, you know, as I say, often, as, as long as you didn't blame the boss, you could blame each other, and actually learn some meaningful lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add a little bit to support. It's not just the Russians. The Americans get first battle in almost every war of one as well. You're getting first first battle in World War II, uh, first battle in Korean War, Task Force Smith, and indeed the watchword is virtually every chief of the army, one of the watchwords has no more Task Force Smiths. Yet they do. One of the key things. Again, I'm going to quote Elliot Cohen and John Boots from the book Military and Fortune. Military failure uh, comes from three things failure to learn, failure to adapt, and failure to anticipate. All militaries fail to anticipate very well at all, which is, I'll say, generous, tangibly, like the last war. It's what they know. And it, it's a potential problem. And the other thing is, of course, nobody who's protected the future of war has ever got it. Matter of fact, I mean, Joe Gutierrez, my favorite American philosopher, once put it, you know, for us, for us, anything is very difficult to develop the future. It's impossible. I just want to add something to that, because this is where, you know, military history in the past has this kind of thing cut off from cultural history. Uh, and, you know, a good military historian is also a historian of the culture of the country. I mean, this, obviously, we're talking about, you know, Many militaries often screw up the first battle, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know there's a sort of cultural element to this. Uh, I mean, I, I could offer a little long-winded explanation of it, perhaps. But this sort of oh, never mind, let's just do it anyway approach, which if you've lived in Russia, you'll see it so many times in so many different aspects of life. It's alien to somebody coming from Britain. You know, I've got used to to sort of rolling with it. Uh, but it's a cultural response to various aspects of life, and I think it just makes that initial failure all that bit worse, often, in the Russian case. And the same might be for the Brits, where, you know, there's a bit more of a tendency to say, okay, uh, you know, how do we deal with this problem? Let's, let's be a bit cautious. Uh, whereas the Russian approach is often, oh, this is complicated, we can't really do it, it's a Lardner, off we go, uh, and we'll take it from there. Those of you who've lived in, in, in you know, experience of uh, Russia will know that at all. We have two more questions here. With, uh, three more questions. This gentleman, that gentleman was a uh, Thank you very much, both presenters. So, uh, question I'm hoping you can both answer this. Um, so, 
been a lot of discussion around munitions, technology, manpower. What about the uncomfortable regime change question? I mean, I know that Alex, you alluded to, uh, you know, the fear factor and uh, Mr. Prigozhin, the wing fell off his airplane recently. Um, so, but we did hear in Canada recently about, you know, Justin Trudeau saying that India were involved in an assassination attempt here last year. We know that historically Americans maybe haven't got the best of record, but I was thinking about Grenada again recently, that came up with the anniversary just having gone by. So, think any back channel stuff's going on, or whether to take people out or persuade people, is there any leverage there? And in particular, I'm thinking about a, a, a scholar whose name I can't remember that talked about in terms of like autocrats. 70% of the time, the change comes from within. Eventually, people kind of go, you know, we've got to do something here, and, uh, and maybe somebody gets toppled. So, just wondering whether this question has any traction for uh, when the situation might change beyond the stalemate that you both seem to identify. Well, I think I'll go with that question. I mean, uh, I think Putin's actually quite popular in Russia. You know, don't believe the Western press. He's, in fact, very popular. Uh, you know, if you have to really go back to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s and the chaos uh, and under Boris Yeltsin, along comes Putin and there is clearly a relationship between a higher degree of order, economic improvement, uh, with Vladimir Putin's leadership, you know, uh, and, you know, Russians crave the order and stability that Vladimir Putin's rule seems to have brought. Now, obviously, you know, Economically, things are a little shakier now, but at the same time, you know, things, there is this idea that you know, Russia is under a, a broader attack from the West that has an awful lot of traction. Um, I don't, I don't, obviously, palace coups can happen. I, I, I don't want to say I, it's not going to happen, but I don't think Vladimir Putin's position is particularly weak at the moment. But, uh, you know, you know, I think. The West made it very easy for them by taking a we're not going to negotiate at all approach and Vladimir Putin and the government could turn around and say, look, they've been gunning for us all along. You know, they're not even willing to compromise here. There's no talk of you know, they were the ones, so one of the narrative goes, that pushed Zelensky in the spring of 2022 to continue the war. This is not a war. This, the Ukrainians are kind of incidental. This is the West is out to get us. This is Russian civilization is at risk. And that's a pretty strong motive. Um, I was just wondering about, uh, okay, as we all know, like, winning a war, what does that mean? It's not simple just winning, right? Uh, so, uh, from Russia's point of view, how do they expect to win, even if all the Ukrainians gave up and they took away the Donbass and Crimea and all that area that they have, and Ukraine surrendered? Um, how did Russia expect to win at the end of the day? They won militarily, but politically, like all the problems they've created that, you know, they've wiped cities off the face of the earth, the beheadings, the uh, executions of civilians and stuff like that, and all these problems that they've created. They can't win from that, or how do they win from that? And you know, the isolation they've created for themselves as well on the world stage, that you know, they have no friends, or at least no one wants to admit to be their, their friends, but everyone's too embarrassed, right? Even like China, it's like we're just gonna kind of quietly stay out of this, right? Um, so how do they expect to win? What is victory for them? I mean the Western the Western media paints a very distorted picture of the world. Russia has quite a few good relationships in the world. Obviously, you know, we don't know exactly what the relationship with China. Obviously, BRICS as an organization is now expanding. Uh, you, if you were watching UN votes early on in the war, you noticed a lot of African countries were not willing to vote against Russia. Uh, they were going to vote against, but they weren't going to vote for, right? It was like either you go. Well, obviously, they don't want to upset the, you know, they don't want to upset the Americans either. But you know, there's been a lot of pressure put on a lot of these countries, and yet they still aren't willing to uh, back the West. And obviously, you know, BRICS is expanding. Over, you know, 
<laughs> it's not a question of oh the Russians are poor part of BRICS, we don't want to join BRICS. If you've been paying attention, uh, BRICS has just added a number of nations, and there is a long list of nations that want to join BRICS. And Russia is obviously you know number two behind China in the BRICS organization. I mean there's a lot of sentiment, you know, you only have to step uh, a little bit outside the Western media to understand that this sort of idea of a multipolar world uh, has a lot more traction outside the West. So. We have time for one last question. I'm going to ask for a couple of questions. Oh, one over two more questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, this question is for Dr. Hill. Um, actually, I'm thinking like, do um, you think Russia will disintegrate after the war ends? What are your thoughts? Uh, will Russia disintegrate after the war ends? Oh. I, I don't see why Russia should disintegrate. I know that there are some Western commentators who wish that, including some of my colleagues in other universities. But I, I you know, Russia, I mean, one, one thing I think that people forget about Russia is sort of culturally, Russia's a quite homogeneous country. Uh, you know, there's already, already the feeling that Russia has been stripped down to the bare bones by losing, you know, losing elements that were uh, Soviet, other elements of the Soviet Union. You know, we've got a, one thing about Russia is that the population, you know, they all speak the same language, there are a few dialects. Uh, you know, there's a very strong sense of national identity as opposed to regional identity. I, I don't see any, any likelihood of Russia collapsing, fragmenting, or anything. And, and, and to be fair, I'm not sure we want to see that. No! <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're running we out of time, but I'm going to ask for both Dr. Fair and Dr. Gill to give us a nation uh, at the end. And we also have the group here, so there will be a chance to talk. So you can choose. Which of these two questions you will answer? The first is what's your comment in terms of the lessons and observations in regard to naval uh, operations and activities? And the ultimate question is it seems to me there's absolutely nothing different in this conflict in regard to what happens to civilians. Is that valid or what do you see different? Uh, I'll take the second part first and then come back to the first part. You know, civilians are always the losers in any war. Uh, Western military tries best as they can to minimize civilian casualties, but the moment you are fighting in things like cities or around small towns, it's one of the horrors of the war. It's one of the things that always appalls me is how many civilians find in the war. And we're going to see the same thing in the Israel, you know, we're going to see the same thing in the uh, Sands and civilians, not Hamas, are basically taking most of the casualties to this part of the world. And if they go in, it's going to be because if Hamas is going to be right. We stand behind our people, we go up front with targets, and they stand behind the line, and they're going to go on the demonic great mass count, because they're terrible. Other militaries, the Russian military and the Palestinians, do they tend to be a little bit less concerned about civilian casualties. You've seen that in Syria, on uh, as part of the way it worked out. So, no, no, that doesn't change. Uh, the Western military, the U.S. military, right, they try as best as they can, but for a limited period. As for the other one, naval warfare, again, you can't see all these things. None of these things are new. The Ukrainians have been very good at using drones, including recently some of the drones, to basically push back parts of the Russian class of the fleet. Maybe some people say maybe it is part of a common location to move this out. But the US Navy is looking at all kinds of drones, robotic uh, things right now to basically unmanned vehicles that will basically go sit off the coast of China with mines on it, and the Chinese ship comes out because the air kind of blocked in on the choke points and just pops out. You can sit there for years. They've been working on this. It's not like this is big. 
What's interesting about the Ukrainian thing is they're building this from scratch. Uh, just like they're doing their drums, body drums. Uh, except basically they're about three black walls from most of the things. Like two, three, three deep planters from most of the things. They were really put a lot of them together, beautiful things together. Put one together, send it off, they lose it, or get shot down, or it's affected. They build another one. They built it about 10 times a day, of which only about three and a half feet deep in parts. Part of the country is the dynamic. Again, yeah, it's a change in naval warfare, but again, is it going to be a radical change? Not sure about that. The thing is, one looks at the other context, the other geography, distance. It's war. The logistics of fighting against China are absolutely important in terms of logistics. 6,000 kilometers of Pacific Ocean between the West, it's about 3,500 miles of Hawaii. East China, China. That's why they're trying to build bases there. But even there, I don't know, Guam, one of the main military bases out there, we've been building up aircraft, air defense, aircraft, aircraft, air defense systems, and things like that. For the last six months, we've been watching Ukraine. We need more. Because they know that's a target. It's a big target from Guam. Say no, trying to wait a minute. Right through all that, that we can be on the one that is in the Just some of that, so from a positive point of view, I think it's a bit, the, 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 the sort of big shift debate, you know, are they too vulnerable? Is it a bit like the tank debate? You know, the tanks are vulnerable, but we still need them. The big ships are extremely vulnerable, we've known that for a long time, but the sea is so important because if you want to move anything of any any weight or volume, you're going to have to move it by sea. You can protect it, even if the ships are vulnerable. You know, the, when you threaten to suck the mass bar, the cruiser, and it's not because it's nice to me. You know, that was a Brit, the Falklands War, the Argentinians had a handful of XSM missiles. There's nowhere to hide in the sea. Uh, it's just Western navies haven't had to fight an opponent that's got real meaningful capabilities. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't hate to have seen what would have happened in the Soviets. That fought the Americans at sea. I mean, the Soviets got to the point of developing large warships that were basically barges to carry a load of missiles that they would fire off and hope to hit the American carrier, knowing that their warship would get sunk. Uh, you know, these vulnerabilities are nothing new. So, uh, in a way, I think there are parallels with the tank issue. You know, that is the aircraft carriers again, one of them here. That's right. Alex, I'm going to ask you since you're up, if you can just sum up, if you have any closing comments. Um, uh, really? Uh, just that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just hope that, uh, well, uh, I just hope that, uh, you know, sense prevails soon and, uh, some sort of giving ground and negotiation stuff, because I don't see anybody bringing it up to hand, and, uh, either it's going to happen sooner or later, or it's going to be one of those conflicts. Again, I just want to reiterate something like you said earlier. What we're seeing this war is nothing new, rather than just it's evolutionary changes, some of them are tactical adaptations, all this other stuff. We won't really know how significant this war is in terms of impact of what's going on, which is for a decade to come at least. So looking back, you can really start to see, it. again, we're talking about revolutions in military affairs, internal things. Those take about 50, 60, 70 years, actually, from the start to the end. I mentioned infiltration tactics. The outcome of that is the Marine Corps' doctrine of the war. That's where it started. And they got to that in, oh, 1989. Started developing in the late 1970s. It takes a long time. The thing is, there's steps forward and there's steps backwards. It's not a linear process as militaries change. And that's why, again, it's going to be interesting to see how what gets adapted, how it gets adapted, how, it, how the adjustments are. At the moment, they're just starting to think this stuff through. A lot of the last things observed, a lot of the ones we didn't even talk about. And, and they're still trying to figure out what are the answers. We know they need to be addressed, but what are the answers? Some of them have big technology, some of them get trained. Coming back to the point, they're already, going, they're already moving down those roads. But where the outcome is, no, yeah. uh, I always go back to 
get, did a long based study of the U.S. Army. Uh, you might remember the, the, the future combat system. No, you don't remember? Well, they killed it. Didn't work. Right? We will have situational awareness. We don't need mass. Yeah, they do need mass. You need armor. You need protection. They spent about 23 to 25 billion dollars developing that system. They couldn't even get the comms to work on a moving vehicle, which is one of the core illnesses. They're still working on that. They killed that in 2008. They've been working on developing mobile comms for the last 20 years and still not there. Sometimes you go, easy. We have the technology. And it's not always that easy. Technology always doesn't play out the way you think it's going to. It's not always as good as you think it is. So, ask me again in 10 years if I'm still around kicking and, and still doing this stuff. <laughs> well, we've heard two amazing, very thought-provoking talks before us. This is obviously indicative, and the, the questions that are being asked uh, show the, 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 the depth of what we are dealing with and the importance of, of this. So I'd like to take this time to, of course, thank uh, David Dubody uh, and his, uh, and his uh, staff for working with us so that we can, in fact, engage with you and, 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 and have these discussions. Um, these are uncomfortable realities. These are uncomfortable elements, but to ignore them, of course, is just simply to encourage the worst of them. An uninformed public will always be making the worst decisions and the worst uh, approaches. And so I'd like to take this time to thank both Terry and Alex for their very insightful comments. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. to continue to facilitate and build our relationships throughout the city in terms of studying and examining these issues. So this, of course, is just the beginning of what we see as a very important continuation of this, these types of discussions. Now, as David has pointed out, there's still food left. The bar is still open. I believe both gentlemen can stick around for, for some time. Uh, so thank you very much. What? Take it to the black Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.